This is the Platinum Podcast. Welcome to the Platinum Podcast. Glad to be here, Joe. Oh, I'm excited for this one. You'd, you'd never Me actually too. know uh, this was a perfect little setup for Conor McGregor five, ten minutes ago, <laughs> yeah, would you? Right. Yeah, I know. We really adapted this quite well. It's actually looking pretty fresh. It actually looks like a studio again. This place transformed rather quickly. Oh, yeah. no. We did good. Good work, team. Good work. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm really excited to to get into this one with you, man. Really Thanks, excited. Man. Me we, too. We've obviously had a lot of different conversations, and mm-hmm. with where Bitcoin's at right now, obviously it's blowing up. the yeah. The buzz around Bitcoin is absolutely insane, and I feel like everybody's coming at it from a monetary point of view, mm-hmm. which makes hell of a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of money to be earned. Everyone's getting hyped up about crypto. But what I love about your angle is you really approach it from a more philosophical point of view and what really Bitcoin is. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to really set the foundation here. So I'd love to know a little bit about your background and how you became to be so heavily invested in Bitcoin. Okay. Yeah. I, um, I guess I would, to start from the beginning, I was always a very curious kid. Um, I, remember I grew up in Tennessee, which is kind of a place out in the wilderness a bit in the U.S. And we went camping a lot. We had a trampoline in the backyard. And I always found myself just staring up into the stars and wondering what what the hell is going on here. And um, as soon as I started reading, which is around the age of 10 or 11, you know, in school, they would send us with a, a summer reading book. We have to go, take it home over the summer reading and come back. So kind of got into this habit of reading books. I decided I was going to go learn what's going on here. So I went straight to the deep end of the pool and started reading about astrophysics. And um, that was it. I mean, I read it nonstop, like three or four years, read all the Stephen Hawking books, Brian Greene. And that, I think, I didn't know it at the time, but in retrospect, just laid this foundation for me to really think about things from a first principle standpoint. Um, And just ever since then, I've been kind of a deep thinker. So I think that that ties into the philosophical perspectives I have on Bitcoin and whatnot. Um, But fast forward a little bit into kind of my high school years, I had taken more of an interest in more worldly things. So I guess being in sport and getting interested in girls and whatever sort of naturally extends to getting interested in the money and business, like what are you going to do with yourself? And I started to become fascinated with economics. I was reading The Economist magazine pretty regularly. Um, and I eventually stumbled on this book, The Creature from Jekyll Island, which is about the inception of the Federal Reserve, which is the U.S. Central Bank. And that's a very interesting read. Um, I would say it opened my eyes to what I consider to be kind of the evil or, or, or monopolized or corrupt heart of the world. Like there's this general feeling in the world I think a lot of people experience in one way or another, that the world has corruption in it. And I identified this as the heart of that. And um, so it was kind of, that left a mark on me. Uh, I knew I wanted to go to college and be a businessman. I didn't really know what that meant. Thought I'd be you know, carrying a briefcase, sending faxes, collecting paychecks, something like that all the time. And um, I kept studying money. I ended up getting a master's degree in accounting and finance. Um, but I was always left with this, this mark of, you know, this, this system of central banking is what's wrong in the world, but there was nothing that could be done about it. So it was almost like you see the game, you see how the game is rigged, but you realize that there's no escape hatch to the game. So you just start playing the game pretty much. Um, and Ended up getting my degree, had my master's degree. I was a certified public accountant for a while um, and I was playing the game. I was a CFO for a few tech companies, living the fiat lifestyle, um, you know, making money, traveling, et cetera, et cetera. And um, it wasn't until actually 2014 that I discovered Bitcoin. I think I heard of it in 2013, but I, it took me a few times hearing about it before it sort of stuck. And I started to pay attention, but I, I tell this story a lot, but I was in Costa Rica at the time. I was on vacation, myself and my girlfriend and another couple. And the guy in the other couple was a banker. So he's a private banker at Wells Fargo. And we're having this argument in Santa Teresa, a little surf town. And he's saying that cryptocurrency was the term he's using at the time 
would absolutely never work. Like governments and banks would 100% ban it. It would never work. It was complete bullshit. And my position was the opposite, that it was inevitably going to eat the world. Like software is eating everything in the world. Money's no exception, pretty much. But I always kick myself because at the time I was operating under this fallacy that Bitcoin was like version one was, uh, if you want to say, maybe the Netscape of what would become, you know, version 50 would be the thing that eats the world. Um, Not having looked deeply enough into it to realize that Bitcoin is the innovation. And um, so I had a little bit of Bitcoin then, bought some, sold it for double, triple the money, thought I was a genius, still hadn't gone down the rabbit hole. And then fast forward to 2016, it was actually in studying uh, Ethereum, which is a, a, an alternative crypto asset. When I stumbled across the concept of smart contracts, um, which is basically a, uh, a way of executing commercial contracts via software. So instead of having the courts enforce the contract terms, you use software. And I, I discovered this concept and found a guy named Nick Zabo who had written about it in the late 90s. And that was my light bulb moment. I was like, holy shit, the whole finance industry is this smart contract with human beings on top of it. So the finance industry itself is just an intermediate function. It's not adding any value. It's not making any stuff. It's not providing any services. You could say it is the service it provides is matching buyers and sellers. And buyers and sellers are what generate wealth in the market. So the the realization I had was there's so much cost trapped in this layer, the finance industry, that software can eat collapse these costs to near zero, which means all that wealth would be freed up to to market participants. So buyers and sellers could be matched more easily. And that was my like epiphany that this tech, this wave of innovation, which I was calling crypto at the time was the big deal. Um, and I started investing in the space. Uh, this was again, late 16, 2017 was a monster year. Market cap exploded 1800%. Um, we ended up launching a business in the space. We were focused on sort of consulting and hedge fund operations. And I could tell people it was where my money went, my mind followed. So I was invested in these, these assets. I was studying them more closely. And in that process, my focus became increasingly uh, narrowed to Bitcoin over time because I my ultimate realization was that, okay, smart contracts are cool, um, which it's not actually Ethereum that will be doing those most likely it's other stuff we can get into that later. But the big breakthrough here, really the first principle breakthrough is that Bitcoin is a tool that's disruptive to gold itself. And gold is the foundational layer on which central bank is built. So central banking is, uh, you could call it the pyramid scheme built on top of gold. Right. We all transact in dollars that were once redeemable for gold. That redeemability has since been revoked. So now these centralized institutions control all the real money in the world, which is gold. And all of us are forced to transact in these government debt certificates that are not actually worth anything. And this is not the first time this experiment has been run. We've had fiat currency. Uh, it originated in ancient China. Uh, we've had it multiple implementations throughout history. They all end the same. They all end in hyperinflation because the issuer of the currency can basically just print dollars, print paper, essentially, use it to buy people's time and resources. And if you just think about the incentives associated with that, what happens? They overprint, they buy all the goods and resources, the currency loses all of its value, the civilization built on it collapses. So this is the game we've been playing throughout history. And that's why Bitcoin is such a big deal because Bitcoin, it's a new game it breaks this cycle of criminality that central banking has been perpetrating on humanity since the dawn of time, pretty much. Interesting. Um, I'd like to just pause you there. Yeah. I think it's a really good point. So to jump in and say, so what is Bitcoin? How would you define this? So I feel like it's one of those terms now. I feel like much when Bitcoin launched off last time, mm-hmm. everyone jumps on, everyone sees it as a massive opportunity to earn money. But nobody really does the research. You're somebody that's been there, done it, you've experienced it, you've ridden the first wave, so to speak. And now you're in a place where you have a very specialized point of view. What is Bitcoin? So you can break that down for somebody who's just jumping on this new wave. Yeah, it's a seemingly simple question with a whole lot of answers. But (laughs) I, to get to that, to answer the question properly, 
um, and I named the the show and the podcast I'm doing the What Is Money Show for this reason because I think you have to answer that question. You need to first answer the question, "What is money?" And it's another sounds like a simple question, but the more you ask it, the more layers of the onion just keep peeling back. And to keep it as simple as possible, we can say that money is just the most tradable asset in any economy. So an economy is just a group of people trading their time, trading the things they create with their time, uh, specializing on what they're good at and trading with others that specialize in the same way. And in doing that, we create, we increase productivity. So we create wealth actually. And this is economics 101 comparative advantage. If you can make hats faster than I can make boots, we both gain by you focusing on hats, me focusing on boots and us trading. We create more hats and boots per man hour relying on one another than we do living in isolation. That builds in the layers and it's, that's the reason, um, like we were talking about earlier, 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, you had to spend 12 hours a day breaking your back in the sun just to have food on the table and a roof over your head, hopefully. Whereas today, thanks to the free market and all the wealth that's been generated from these layers of, of comparative advantage, we can work how many, you know, maybe two hours a day to, to eat and have shelter, depending on your, your situation. Sure. So we've, we've increased the aggregate wealth in the world by trading and having interdependence with one another. And in that system of trade, money is just the most tradable thing. So whatever asset it has can be exchanged for the most other things is by definition money. So even in like a um, prison environment, you see people trading cigarettes using that as a currency. Like there's a money there, right? They don't have access to anything else, but because everyone likes to smoke and these things are divisible and portable, they exhibit a few properties of money, they become money essentially. Mm -hmm. So historically, money's taken a lot of different forms. Um, a lot of different tools have been tried as money, tried and failed over time. We've had seashells, we've had salt, we've had glass beads, we've had women, we've had cattle, we've had all kinds of things that have been used as money. But through this free market process throughout history, uh, market participants have tended to favor the asset that, that exhibits five properties. And th this, these five properties are the first principle of money. It's like whatever tool best satisfies, satisfies these five things tends to become money. And they are divisibility, which means the thing can be broken down and recombined at various scales. Um, durability, which means the asset persists over time. Recognizability, which means it can be, uh, its authenticity can be verified and tested or audit the supply even. Um, Portability, which means you can move it across space, can be transported. And then lastly is scarcity, which means that its supply is resistant to change. People can't just go out and counterfeit it or, or just mine a ton of gold very easily. Because if you can do that, you increase the supply rapidly, which means you diminish the value of everyone that's holding the money. So that's the classic inflation situation. As markets progressed over time, it was found, basically discovered through these natural market processes that monetary metals best satisfied the first four properties. They're the most durable, divisible, recognizable, and portable tool on the planet. Of the monetary metals, gold is the most scarce, meaning that its, its supply is the most resistant to inflation. No matter how hard we try to go out and mine gold, we can increase its supply the most slowly. So this meant if you chose to park your wealth in that medium, you knew that you weren't going to get debased more than say 2% a year at, at whatever the gold mining rate is. So that is why gold became money and gold is money. Um, problem with that is that gold is very heavy, expensive to secure. And it turns out that it's a lot better business to just put gold in one warehouse and issue uh, warehouse receipts, basically, or banknotes that are redeemable for gold. And then we can go and transact this paper much more quickly and easily uh, and redeem it for gold when we need. So that became, that warehouse function became the bank. That bank became the central bank. So essentially the bank solved the portability issue at this point. 
Exactly right. It was a technological failing of gold that it lacked portability, that the bank was necessary. But the problem is, is you introduced the need to trust the bankers. You needed to trust that the banks would not issue more paper than they had, than their gold reserves could justify. Big problem there. Big problem. Because we've now shifted the control over money from natural law, right? We can't produce any more gold no matter how hard we try, to men, fallible, corruptible men. And that's that's the story of the central bank, basically. And to get to Bitcoin, no one saw this coming. So by the way, that like 5,000 years of human history determined that gold is money. So gold is the game we've been playing. And this is true even if you don't own any physical gold or don't have any of this knowledge. You live in a country whose laws, the authority they wield over you, is rooted in the sovereignty of either their own gold holdings or their agreements with other countries that protect their security that hold gold. So we're all in this game, this gold game, and we've been playing it forever. No one saw Bitcoin coming. It's 2008, uh, you know, open source piece of software is released into a chat room. And, you know, gloss over some of the history, but basically people started mining it, which meant they could turn electricity into this absolutely scarce coin called Bitcoin. And mining, just to clarify, is solving computer problems, essentially. That's right. So they're part of the Bitcoin algorithm is that to produce new coins, you have to enter into this competition. And the competition is to solve a math problem, essentially. Mm -hmm. And that that game becomes more difficult the more players come onto the network, basically. So it draws people in by rewarding them. So initially regarded as kind of a toy or a joke or, or collectible or whatever, no one took it seriously. People eventually started exchanging this thing over the internet because it was scarce. It was very portable. You could beam it over a telecommunication channel. One of the first transactions was a guy that bought two large pizzas for 10,000 Bitcoin. And then, so as people started to trade goods and services for this thing, it eventually established an exchange value that people would trade dollars for this thing. So at this level, we're essentially in prison trading cigarettes in these early stages. That's right. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, you know, I don't know, no one saw this coming. So it was just, it seemed like a joke in the beginning as, as even the internet did. When the internet first started out, people thought it was a joke. You know, people are using it to... Uh, you know, do nefarious things or whatever. <laughs> we're, we're trading like XP points of like clan, <laughs> or Clash of Clans or something. Yeah, like. yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so fast forward a little bit more and Bitcoin, it's monetized in that it has established a market trading value. People will trade currency or assets for Bitcoin. So now this thing's a real asset. Right? It's a real asset trading 24 by 7. It has a has a globally established market exchange value. And since then, it's been the fastest growing asset in human history. And if we look at it to answer the question, what is Bitcoin? If we just evaluate it through the lens of those first principles, it's like, okay, money needs to be divisible, durable, recognizable, portable, scarce. How does Bitcoin stack up to gold? Bitcoin, because it's pure information, Right. And the, the common moniker is digital gold, which I think is a pretty apt analogy. Um, it's basically infinitely divisible. So each Bitcoin can be broken down into 100 million units. If that were ever not enough for some reason, like if Bitcoin becomes so valuable, that's not enough. It can be increased. So the software can actually increase the divisibility. Um, Bitcoin is infinitely durable because and this is a little bit tricky. Durable meaning it persists over time. It's information stored everywhere and nowhere. So everyone, every miner that operates and every node that operates is Bitcoin. It has the entire transaction history located on one device. And every other device has the same thing and they're all constantly checking one another's work. So the analogy I like to use here is something like the Bible that's just distributed information. You could go and edit the Bible or make changes to it, but your changes would be rejected by the collective, right? Because the Bible's stored everywhere, nowhere, people are like, no, this is, by consensus, this is the Bible. Your modifications don't make sense. So it's self-managing, essentially. Yeah, self-managing, self-regulating, if you want to call it that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why something like the Bible outlasts empires, because it's distributed information. Um, clearly, Bitcoin's super portable. 
because you can shoot information at the speed of light. You can't get much faster than that. Um, it's very recognizable, meaning that if you're running a node, you can authenticate if Bitcoin is Bitcoin, which like with gold, you used to have to do tests to make sure it wasn't lead painted gold. Bitcoin, you can verify and you can also audit the supply. So any node can audit the entire global supply. And then finally, and really interestingly, as I've argued in some of my writing, Bitcoin's the discovery of absolute scarcity. So the best thing we ever had historically in gold was relative scarcity, meaning that it was the hardest thing to produce. No matter how much time and energy we put towards it, it was the hardest thing to produce. That's what gave it monetary value because it was a, it was a sound store of value. People couldn't inflate the supply. Bitcoin, via that difficulty adjustment in the mining algorithm, it is the only instance we've ever had of something that is perfectly scarce. It's 21 million units will ever exist. No one can change that. The more people that enter the game and try to mine this thing harder, the more difficult the game becomes. So it's constantly adapting to new market participants trying to mine it. And it adheres perfectly to this, this supply curve. And it's interesting because we know that supply curve from T0, which is 2009 when Bitcoin, Bitcoin has launched, all the way as a 2140 when the last Bitcoin will be mined. And the price has followed the supply curve damn near perfectly. So we have this technology that's superior to gold in every way, and its price is following a predetermined algorithmically set curve. So it's really interesting that it's something that's disruptive to gold and it gives people kind of a perfect um, storehouse of value or information about money. So we don't know what's going to happen. We, we're This entire game that we've been playing, we're talking about with gold, it's like a new, it, it's the rug is being pulled out from under the central bank. The central banks put all their eggs in the basket that if we control the gold, we control the world because gold controls the world. But now there's a technology that's disruptive to gold and the future uh, is very uncertain as a result. So at this point, we have no idea on what the impact this is going to have on the world. That's right. At all. That's right. So there's a few different interesting theories. And when you talk about this completely replacing gold, essentially that completely realigns the power structure of this planet. That's right. And that could develop in many different ways. Now, I recently heard you talking to Gary Vaynerchuk on a podcast. Mm -hmm. um, really interesting. He asked a really interesting question. Albeit, I'm, I love Gary Vaynerchuk, I've got to say. I've taken a lot of value from him over the years. Um, but I was actually really eager to hear your response. And I don't feel like I actually got to hear <laughs> it on that particular podcast. Yeah. Um, but he asked a really valid question that I thought was interesting. What happens to Bitcoin when big governments start getting involved? What happens when or nations, so to speak, China, Russia, United States, they start to see this, they're losing the power here because they don't have any control over Bitcoin. Yeah. What does that look like? I hope you guys are enjoying this episode of the Platinum Podcast brought to you by Platinum University, the real life school of mindset, online business and financial independence. Platinum University teaches you everything conventional education missed. We're helping thousands of people to create multiple passive income streams that create more money, time and freedom. We literally guide you through every step of the process with the help of our in-house experts and our powerful like-minded community groups. To get 35% off your monthly subscription, permanently lock in the discounted price of $39.99 and get access to our mindset, forex, drop shipping, stocks, crypto, affiliate marketing and property content, visit platinumuniversity.co.uk forward slash join. Yeah, this is the $100 trillion question because <laughs> that's approximately the value of global money. Global narrow money is about $100 trillion, which is 100,000 billion, just a staggering number. It's a big game. Big, game, big game, big game, the game, like the market, you know, money and real estate are the, pretty much the two biggest markets in the world. Um, nobody knows. We don't have a historical precedent for this. Um, and on this topic, I always point people, which was the book Gary and I were discussing, to the book Sovereign Individual, yeah. uh, written in the late 90s. It predicted social media. It predicted Bitcoin. It predicted the digitization of other securities. Um, so it's been pretty prescient to say the least. And the general thesis of that book is that software is, is eating the world, but it's also eating government. Um, and one of the, the more profound predictions is that once 
what they called anonymous digital cash became a thing, which is Bitcoin. Um, it essentially serves as the ultimate offshore bank of the digital age. The state itself, and this is all governments, all nation states, they generate revenue through taxation, which is they're billing you part of your income or, or part of your assets every year, and inflation, which is where they're printing new money that they control and then externalizing that cost onto society. So society pays higher costs for everything year over year. That's because the government's manipulating the money supply, as we discussed earlier. The incentives for citizens to move into a money that cannot be inflated at all, like Bitcoin, and is much more difficult to tax, become increasingly enormous as governments print more money and increase inflation and taxation. So the thesis of this, of this book was that, and to maybe put a, a little bit of numbers on it first, if you're paying even a small tax bill annually, you're paying $10,000 a year to the tax man, and alternatively, if you could save that money instead, put it in a savings account that yielded 10% every year, and you compound it for 40 years, just a normal average lifetime earnings, that's $4.4 million, right? So the decision becomes for even the little guy that's only paying $10,000 a year, if he could instead put that money into Bitcoin and not touch it and know that it's not going to suffer from any inflation or any taxation, not assuming any price appreciation in Bitcoin, that that would grow to $4.4 million. So it's the, the comparison is like, if someone came to you and offered you $4.4 million to move to a tax haven, would you do it? This is the calculus people are gonna be starting to run with Bitcoin. And that's again, for the small guy. Yeah. You go to 100,000 a year, you're talking about 44 million or more. The flip side of that is quite interesting. If you look at it from a governmental perspective, right. now you're looking at that individual who's getting 4 million. Now times that by the amount of people that live in your particular respective nation. Yep. Well, that's the size of the game they're playing if people start to step outside their game, right? That's right. That's this, right. This is why it's so monumental. That's right. And it's that's why it's disruptive to the nation state because that is their sole source of revenue. People, citizens, so government needs to tax and inflate to generate revenue. The more it taxes and inflates, the more it incentivizes people to leave the game to exit into Bitcoin, the more people that leave the game, the faster their revenues decline. So the big question here is what happens when nation state revenues plummet? What, what becomes the organizational model for humanity when our national identity or, or these national structures that we take for granted, we think, oh, this piece of land is America. This piece of land is Russia. This piece of land is China. What happens when those business models, the revenue is good to zero in a decade or so. That's a really interesting concept because I, especially in the conversation you were having with Gary, he was referring to like nations as nations. That's right. They're only essentially nations because they group together by this structure. What That's happens right. when the structure disappears? Are they even nations anymore? That's right. You know, now we're just, yep. now we're talking about a network of individuals. We're not yes. talking about nations and the power they wield because that's lessening day by day. That's right. So this is when it becomes a really interesting thought experiment, right? Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> and as we were, we were talking about earlier, it's all of these considerations and questions, the reason they're so hard to think about is because they're, they're a priori, which means no priors. So when I think, when I'm talking about what is money, we all think in dollars or whatever our local currency is. To understand that, you actually have to think about what is thinking. Like I'm thinking in dollars, why am I thinking in dollars? So you have to have this metacognition about things. Mm -hmm. And when we start talking about nation states, it's the same thing. It's like, what is Russia going to do? And you're like, well, wait a minute, what is Russia? It's all of these groups of you know people with uh, social connections, commercial connections, power and wealth distributed within this land that a, uh, a government has drawn a line around essentially with their military and said, this is Russia, yeah. but it's not one autonomous entity that just moves one way or the other, like ba based on what Putin says, there's a lot of uh, political dynamics at play to say the sure. least. So the thesis of this book is that everyone's running this calculus, by the way, it's not just like man versus government. It's like even people in the government are running this calculus. Like they're in it, they're right. in it. Right. And they're seeing this thing, as people exit into Bitcoin, it's market caps getting pushed up. It's natural human incentive to chase what's rising in price, which is how Bitcoin keeps sure. bootstrapping itself. 
pe- more people start to buy it in anticipation of others buying it, and it becomes this positive feedback loop, crushes government revenue, and then thereby it's dissolving the power structures, right? It's, it's dissolved. Again, if all of the authority is derived from gold holdings and Bitcoin is demonetizing gold in this process, then all of a sudden we're like transitioning into an entirely new game. And that's when this is where it's hard to even understand the implications. It's, like, it's not like a full frontal attack, is it? It's not like it's being the government's being nuked. It's no. literally imploding, yes. essentially, isn't it? It's just disintegrating yes. from the inside yes. in all these different spaces. Rather than looking like at this table as a whole, we need to have to get down to a cellular level. Exactly, right. exactly what's going on here. You yeah. know, what are the atoms that yes. are involved in this? How are they going to react? How are the atoms incentivized? Almost? Yeah. yeah. And, it, I, and the piece I'm writing about it, I say that we're dissolving these nation state power structures in digital acid. So it's like, it's, it's the incentive schema itself is being dissolved from the inside. And there's a couple of historical parallels to this. So one is uh, the fall of feudalism, actually. So the church at the end of the 1500s, they had a monopoly on knowledge. So they had the scriptoria, they produced all the books. They controlled all the thought. Most people were illiterate, so they went to the priests to understand things, you know, and all the while they're paying them out, right? It's That was the dominant institution in the world. This institution, though, because it was bureaucratic, it was just becoming less and less effective over time. So it was delivering lower quality service at higher prices, which is what we see the government doing today. So what happens? Printing press is invented the last decade of the 1500s. 10 million books are produced in 10 years. That was approximately equal to, the, it took the 490 years prior to that to produce 10 million books. All of a sudden, 10 years go by the printing press, we have 10 million books produced. The church's monopoly on knowledge is broken. People start re- reading becomes more of a thing, right? More thinkers emerge, more heretical thinkers emerge. The church realizes, holy shit, this is a, this invention that no one saw coming. Somebody, by the way, someone just pulled together a few other inventions, just like Satoshi did to make Bitcoin, put them into one thing called the printing press that let us crank out books a lot faster. This led to more thinkers, more variety of thinking, uh, more people questioning authority. And as the church tried to, tried to clamp down on this, that actually drove the proliferation and demand for the printing press because people saw, hey, the church is trying to stop this thing. What is this thing? It's drawing more attention to it. So it actually accelerated the proliferation of the printing press and book production. And before you know it, we were in the age of enlightenment, right? People like the church running the world, that makes no sense. Like, let's go out and do science instead. So it made us smarter by, by collapsing the cost of information access. It led to people becoming more critical thinking and more intelligent over time. And I think this digital age that we're in is doing that again. It's basically, once again, collapsed the cost of information access. We can now look, you know, the library of Alexandria, so to speak, is at our fingertips. We all have supercomputers in our pockets. We can access information anywhere, anytime, at any point in history. And I think it's gonna make people smarter over time. And at the core of all this is both the internet, which is that, and Bitcoin is encryption. So it's, we're equating encryption technology to the invention of the printing press. And I think governments, that is the existential threat to government is encryption tech. Because now people can handle their affairs. They can communicate behind this wall of encrypted energy. They can move their capital without a trace behind this wall. Governments cannot penetrate it. They cannot do anything about it. People are now able to self-organize, right, in, in digital communities. So the nation state is becoming less and less relevant at the same time its revenues are collapsing. And I think as they try to clamp down on encryption technology, they're going to drive its proliferation and demand for it, which when Trump, Trump got kicked off Twitter, whatever, two weeks ago, right? That's insane, by the way. Insane. Small example of it, though. Next week, 25 million people signing up to Telegram, an encrypted messaging app. So again, when when government or a large entity, we'd say this was even a private enterprise's uh, doing that they removed him based on terms of service. When you try and stop something and it's informational, you're going to accelerate its development. It's like cutting the head off the Hydra and then seven more pop up, you know? Yeah, um, I love that. I love that. So this takes us into uncharted territory, 
You know, it's the question is, if this primary mode of human socioeconomic organization that we call the nation state, that's very deeply implanted in our identity, how we think, who we are, how we act, our culture, if that fails, what happens next? And so we don't really know, but like in the feudal society, when that system collapsed, everything changed. Culture changed, uh, morals changed, everything. It, the, the incentive structure changed, thereby changing uh, people themselves. So it's, I'm calling it, I, you know, we don't know what it's called. We talk about capitalism, communism in the 20th century. I think encryption technology and Bitcoin more specifically is enabling this new mode of socioeconomic organization that I'm calling sovereignism. Um, and it just means that each person has the more power, more individual power and freedom than we've ever had throughout history to, to move about how we want to move money as we want and to self-organize. So, yeah, I, I love it when you talk about sovereignism, because that's essentially what we're about at the university. That's what yeah. we care about, albeit from a slightly different angle. We all know from our own experiences that not having enough money, having to exchange all of your time for money, mm -hmm. that essentially takes away from your freedom. That's right. And that's exactly what we're trying to push back against. Yeah. We're pushing back against an education system which isn't designed to help you win and yeah. get and get more time, get more money. It's designed to get you a job and keep you within the system. That's right. We're pushing back against that, you know? And I think when you talk about Bitcoin, it's almost like the answer on a bigger scale. I feel yeah. like we're trying to solve the problem from within the system. Whereas yeah. the concepts that you talk about, you're talking about smashing that straight out the other side of the system <laughs> and living completely independently from it. Yeah. And that is something to me as somebody whose primary value is freedom yeah. is hugely, hugely appealing. Yeah, yeah. You know? That's yeah. What... It's, um, you're absolutely right. And it's, we're, none of us can just truly smash outside of the system. Like we're still living in the system. There's no question about it. But the, yeah. the difference now that's, gives us the ability to change this is that we can now store the fruits of our labor, the sweat of our brow, right? That the, the energy and life force that we sacrifice to accumulate wealth, that is absolutely scarce, right? We all, each of us only has a fixed amount of time in this world. We don't know how much time we have, but we know we have a fixed amount of time. It seems logical that we should be able to trade our fixed amount of time, our absolutely scarce time for money that's absolutely scarce that can't be stolen, that can't be inflated. And that's what Bitcoin is. It's, a, it's, a, it's an energy reservoir that can't be compromised. So we can now store life force, if you will, in this money that no one can take. No, no law can be passed to say, I'm, you're, the example you gave earlier of your friend, right? Some banker sitting in some office somewhere around the world said, I'm gonna turn off your account. And all of a sudden he's frozen out of his own money, right? He does not have the keys to his own castle. Which is Bitcoin insane. gives you the keys to your own castle. It's interesting. That just made me think of something. It's almost like we're still storing grain or we're still storing mm -hmm. apples. Essentially, we spend all of our time, a scarce resource, accumulate all these apples that I'm going to use to trade later on. I put them aside and they start to decay over time, yep. which is essentially inflation, right? That's right. I'm starting to lose this asset or yes. what I thought was an asset. Yes. And it's disappearing, slipping through my fingers. That's exactly right. And there, Bitcoin is the answer to that, right? It's not going right. anywhere. No one's it, touching it. It's not decaying. That's exactly right. It's, the, as I wrote in this piece uh, that was really popular called Masters and Slaves of Money, I'm calling Central Bank a pyramid scheme in that it's a, it's a systemized institution of time theft. So there's this commonwealth accruing capital that's all denominated in money, the whole economy is using, but this one institution gets the privilege to just print money as much as they need. Every time they print money, they're stealing time and energy from everyone else. So it's it's parasitic, right? And if you can, and through that lens, you could consider Bitcoin to be like the parasiticide. It just eliminates the parasite from the productive economy and ushers, ushers us into a world that's a lot better because you take theft out of the system. I mean, clearly it's better for everyone except the thieves, but who wants thieves? So. <laughs> it just seems morally superior, pragmatically superior. And that's why you know I just get so excited about Bitcoin and the possibility of the future. This is, this is why it's an exciting time to be alive. That's right. right. It's uh, 
it's unprecedented yeah for sure and i think we're moving in this really really powerful direction this is why i think the the voice that you have why it's so so important because like i say people are getting hyped up about bitcoin and money that's directly relating it back to fiat currency essentially mm -hmm. this is going to give me more dollars yes but there's a bigger picture here which you so wonderfully highlight and break down which is this is actually about sovereignty this mm -hmm. is actually about having our own freedom at the very base level yes so for people that are really kind of stepping into this world what would you advise as being the first step of moving closer to becoming a sovereign individual i know that's a yeah. big big question yeah um i mean i always advise that the first step should be you know it's education it's it's equipping yourself with knowledge um and I think asking these fundamental questions is the path to gaining a greater understanding of what, what's really going on in the world. It's very easy to live the fiat life and be distracted by the bread and circuses, you know, the football and this and the politics. But you need to ask yourself fundamentally, like, politics is a great example. Have you ever stopped to think about why we have these popularity contests every four years that the most popular person gets to decide what laws you're going to abide by and at what rate they're going to steal from you in both taxation and inflation. Like, does that system make sense? Does it seem like that system would have longevity? It, well, it doesn't to me. And yeah. I, I'm also, this kind of leads my mind to thinking about what happens if you suddenly remove the need for all of that because right. the system's organizing itself yes. or at least the people are. Yeah. Then what? Imagine just the units of time and energy would be saved by not watching Donald Trump in a presidential election. 100%. The, yeah. the millions and millions of dollars invested, the yeah. time and energy of millions and millions of people all over the world yes. giving a fuck about what's going on there. Right. What if all of those people are investing their time and energy into things they give a shit about? Right. 100%. Things they enjoy. Yeah. You know? What does that world look like? And it's, it's driving divisiveness in society too, right? Because people, it's the illusion of choice. My two-year-old daughter, if I want to get her to do something, I say, you know, and she doesn't want to do it at all, I would say, oh, well, you get to do it with either A or B, right? We're going to go outside. I don't want to go outside. Well, you get to pick your yellow shirt or your blue shirt, and we're going to go outside. Once she makes a selection and she feels like she has choice, she has the illusion of skin in the game, yet she's still abiding by my my plan, basically. Sales 101, right? That's what <laughs> politics is. Yeah. You have this illusion of choice. Oh, choose the conservative or the liberal party. Are you kidding me? You think the world is that easily bifurcated into black or white and then this popularity contest will solve the many complexities in the real world? Like it doesn't make any sense. So the solution to all of our most complicated problems are problem solvers and problem solvers are entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs operate in the free market and the politics don't matter. The results matter. That's the game we're moving into. Like we're moving to a digital age where how much value do you add to society? That's how much value you reap. Not how much, not how cool you are or how charismatic you are or charming or how many babies you kiss. Like that whole game is going away. And um, so I, I guess I veered a little bit from the question, but I think the first step is education. Um, and then to hold whatever you could, like I just treat Bitcoin as a savings account. So I'm not saying go out and put all your money in Bitcoin. You should learn about it a lot you should invest according to your understanding of the asset and and this bigger game that we're talking about but buy a little buy whatever you can afford to not really think about and then just by buying it i promise you you're going to think about it a lot more and you're going to see the number go up and you're going to ask more questions and you're going to see more weird political headlines and you're going to ask yourself that doesn't make sense so it just it will lead you down this rabbit hole that many people have been down and from my experience, it's changed everyone's life for the better. I feel like you've slid a very interesting proposition across the table there, which is uh, in an American context, are you voting Republican, Democrat, or Bitcoin? That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Bitcoin, that's where we are. Bitcoin is the vote against all politics. I like that vote. Yeah. It I sounds like a vote to me. It's the only one I cast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's the only one you can yeah. go with. So we're in an interesting place where you can look at Bitcoin from two really interesting perspectives. Not only is there um, huge potential in terms of morality i suppose mm -hmm. is a good way to look at yeah. it and then we can also talk about the monetary gains so mm -hmm. obviously people are excited about it the money's going up mm -hmm. or like the value of it is going up mm -hmm. what are your predictions in terms of how that is going to continue to go and also why it has had such a explosive boom in recent months right right, right. um 
So if we look at Bitcoin's entire price history, it's only 12 years old, so we have a pretty small sample size, but the main pattern that appears to be emerging is that every four years, Bitcoin's algorithm cuts its new supply in half. So again, the miners, they're competing in this game. The energy that they're allocating into the network is used to secure the network. So actually the more valuable Bitcoin becomes, the more secure it becomes, which is really interesting. Um, you could think about it like the more money you put in a safe, the harder that safe becomes to crack kind of thing, yeah. but, but at a global level. Um, and this, this has the quality, you can say it two ways. Again, if we're looking at money through first principles, it's increasing its scarcity every four years, which we can quantify with the stock to flow ratio. Um, and not to sound too nerdy, but the stock to flow ratio is just the inverse of the inflation rate. So every four years, Bitcoin inflates more slowly, which means it's a better store of value. So the theory is that every time this new supply flow is cut in half, cut in half by 50% every four years, the miners that are competing for the Bitcoin, they're selling that Bitcoin into the market for dollars to pay their electricity bills, right? It's a ruthlessly capitalistic thing. When that new Bitcoin is cut in half overnight, that selling pressure is cut in half as well. So all of a sudden you've got, you know, supply and demand equals price. Well, supply um, just got cut in half. Demand is constant. So you're selling less Bitcoin to the market, puts upward pressure on its price. So these four year market cycles, Bitcoin's price has mapped onto them perfectly. So we tend to have a halving 12 to 18 months later, we have a new all time high price. The price just goes crazy. You know, it gets way too euphoric, people overpay, and then it collapses 80% or more. And then four years, or again, so that's 12 to 18 months after the halving. You have the other halving again, four years later, same thing happens. 12 to 18 months later, there's a big price spike and it collapses again, but it's always collapsing up. Yeah. Every new low is roughly three to five times higher than the prior, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, prior high. So the new lows are higher than the prior highs. Okay. It's constantly crashing upward. So every time you hear people, oh, Bitcoin crashed again, it's up and down, it's all over the place. It's like, zoom all the way out and tell me which way it's going. Yeah. You look at Bitcoin on a log scale year over year, it goes one direction, it goes up. And to answer why, it's, again, the first principles of money, right? The, 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 the quantifiable value of scarcity which is the most important, one of the most, I would argue the most important property of money. It's what made gold, gold. It's the reason gold is more valuable than silver and all the other monetary metals. That is increasing exponentially. It's doubling every four years. And the market is just digesting this new information. And so it increases in value, but it increases value so quickly, people get euphoric and they chase it. And then it gets way, way overshoots due to the, the hubris and greed of man. And then it corrects. And then the cycle repeats. So the interesting thing about that pattern, though, is we know Bitcoin's stock to flow ratio forever. It's encoded in the algorithm. It cannot be changed. That, if the price follows that supply curve, keeps following that supply curve, we're talking about a $10 million Bitcoin in 2030. So everyone's operating on this information. I think, I think you need to... Repeat that just so, <laughs> so people understand. <laughs> Please repeat I'm, I'm that. not making a price prediction. I'm just saying you can read about this actually. A yeah. uh, guy's name is Plan B. He wrote a piece called uh, Valuing Bitcoin Through Scarcity. I think I said the name of the piece right. And it's called, he's mapping the price to the stock to flow ratio. And the stock to flow ratio is just the, the quantifiable measure of scarcity, basically. Over Bitcoin's 12 year life, it's mapped, it's at a 96% correlation. So it's like extremely highly correlated price to scarcity. We know Bitcoin scarcity forever. We know where it's going. So by the year 2030, that model, which has been 96% accurate so far, predicts a $10 million per Bitcoin US dollar price by the year 2030. So slight disclaimer there, but up until now, it's been predictable with a 96% accuracy. That's right. And what you're saying is based on those calculations, it has the potential to hit 30 million. 10 million per Bitcoin by 2030. Okay, and it goes it goes higher than there, by the way. The model actually breaks because Bitcoin stock to flow ratio goes to infinity. So technically the dollar value goes to infinity. But the point is, 
I'm not saying that model is perfectly right. I'm not saying that model will hold forever. But the longer that model holds, the more people are performing this calculus and saying, well, it's still adhering to the supply curve. I can trace the supply curve out to 2030. It says it's 10 million bucks. If Bitcoin's less than 10 million bucks, I should buy here. Every time someone runs that calculus and makes the buy, they're actually increasing Bitcoin's market cap, putting it closer to that $10 million mark, and other people are running the same calculus. So it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy or positive feedback loop. And this is what Satoshi predicted originally. He's like, this is what the algorithm's intended to do. I have no idea if it's going to work, but it might make sense to get some just in case it catches on. <laughs> and here we are 12 years in. It's the best performing asset in human history by far. Like nothing is even close to it. And there's no signs of it abating anytime soon. We had a halving in May 2020. Here we, we sit today, January 2021. Bitcoin's had a huge run, but it just started. This bull run should continue for the next 12 months. Um, the other, but again, it gets complicated because we think it's going to keep doing these boom and bust cycles. So I'll just, oh, I'll just sell the top and buy the next bottom. Everyone's thinking that. There could come a point where this thing could break to the upside, where people are just no longer selling. They're just buying and holding in anticipation of $10 million Bitcoin or whatever the number is. And that's why I think the best strategy, if you decide you're gonna buy Bitcoin and accumulate, is to just buy and accumulate, don't sell. Uh, now, now, that doesn't mean, if, by all means, if you find your dream house or you have something you're just trying to get to and buy, go do it, that's what money's for. But if you're trying to accumulate Bitcoin to establish wealth, like generational wealth, potentially, like something you could give your children, your grandchildren, whatever, then I think the right strategy is to just keep accumulating over time. Um, and that's it, you know, it's, it's a radically new, new game. We have no idea where it goes, but it does seem to be very much a binary outcome. Either Bitcoin keeps doing what it's doing or something, some black swan protocol, something just takes it out and goes away completely. It doesn't seem to me like it can hold that middle ground because it's designed to go up. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about black swans. What vulnerabilities are there? What risks another big big question another trying to shoot question. off into the universe yeah? 600 billion dollar question yeah uh that's about what bitcoin's market cap is today 600 billion black swans by definition unknown unknowable unknowns so we quite actually can't yeah, i can't even talk about them or predict them but my best estimation is some either cosmic event like a you know, a gamma ray burst from a star that wipes out all the electronics and sends us back to the Stone Age, you know, which would wipe out everything, all the internet, all the stuff, or some protocol risk that no one could see or understand just taking it out. Um, but there's no, and this is a question Bitcoiners ask themselves a lot, is like, what is the actual, how would it actually play out to stop Bitcoin? And that's the thing is the game, theoretically, there's no one can figure it out. So, so at this point, what you're saying is, aside from aliens, I, I, <laughs> yeah, Bitcoin's aliens. looking pretty good right now. I guess aliens could be another threat. Yeah, <laughs> aliens with gamma rays. Bitcoin's looking pretty sweet. It's <laughs> it's a pretty pretty good investment. Yeah, yeah. I think so. I, I'm not going to make you sign your name to that yeah. one. I think that'd be a bit of a weird quote. Robert yeah. Breedlove said that only aliens can stop Bitcoin. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, yeah. So what does this, so what does your time look like now? Where are you investing your time and energy? Because I know that you love to educate people on this because you're passionate about it. It's powerful yeah. and it's something that resonates with us massively here at Partner University. Where are you devoting your time and energy to help people get this information? Yeah, so um, very great. And I mentioned this earlier that Bitcoin, one of the most radically interesting things about it is that anyone that's been deeply involved with Bitcoin or studied it deeply, they report these positive changes in their life. They're all a little bit different. Everyone has their own flavor, but the general theme is lower time preference, which means you're thinking longer term, thinking more about your family, more about your community, more about your health, more about saving, less about spending. Um, it changes you for the better. It really does. And I don't know, I mean, I guess you could say it's just the incentive to save makes you actually a better person. If you hold a money that's appreciating 100% year over year, you're gonna think twice about buying the big screen or the car or whatever, because you can buy it half price next year, right? Yeah, I think you're investing more. It's like delayed gratification, isn't it? Exactly. I think that's what the, the foundational thing is there. 100%. And that's, that's the the kernel of economics is delayed gratification. So it's, it's, it's like imposing this principle on us to be 
more long-term oriented, I guess. And that changes your life for the better. Um, so I'm very grateful Bitcoin has had those impacts on me as well um, in a number of ways. But in particular, I mentioned in the beginning, I've always loved to read and study. But Bitcoin gave me the impetus to start writing. I just so many people are like, what is this thing? What are you learning? And I found no better way than to start, start writing. And in that process, the Bitcoin podcast community is pretty big and popular and noisy. I publish a piece. Everyone's like, oh man, come on and talk about it. We want to hear about it. So I started doing some podcasts. People really enjoyed that, which is something I never thought I would do. And I had no ambitions to be, you know, doing this or, or anything like it. And, um, but it resonated with people, you know, and I was listening to the market and I was like, wow, there's a real hunger for this. People really want to know what's going on. And, um, so from that, I decided that to even just to satisfy my own intellectual curiosity, I wanted to go out and talk to the smartest people I could find and get to the bottom of their thinking, right? Like how do they build their mental models? How are they thinking about Bitcoin? How are they investing? How are they, how are they leading their lives? You know, really get beneath the surface with them. And that's, um, that's why I'm committing my time now is to the show that I mentioned called the What Is Money Show. Um, we've only had one guest so far, which is Mr. Saylor, who bought $1.3 billion in Bitcoin last year in 2020. Um, we recorded for like 11 hours. We've got one more episode to go. We chopped it into, we've done nine episodes. We'll have one to three more. And it's great, man. It's a great series that gets to the bottom of his thinking. And he's one of the smartest people in the world. Like he's just on another level. And anyone that's watched it, they're just thrilled and exhilarated about it. So now for me, I build this entire loop of, I get to keep reading, which is kind of like my base passion. If I had nothing else to do in the world, I'd just read all the time. I then get to synthesize those readings into writing. And then I get to go out and talk about my perspectives and share my perspectives with other, the other people in the world that I think are really interesting or really smart and I want to talk to. And that's it. I get this whole feedback loop of, of learning and education and uh, just share it with the world. You know, someone told me a long time ago that I might butcher this, but the meaning of life is to discover your gift and the purpose of life is to share it with the world. So I feel like I'm on that track actually. And I'm just like we were talking about earlier. I'm just lit up every day. I get up out of bed every morning, like, jazzed you know it's not work anymore it's it's passion so it's powerful <clears throat> that's powerful it sounds like that's exactly where you are it's exactly where i am as well yeah and it's an amazing place to be we had yeah. like a whole <laughs> for yeah. the listeners here we had like a whole 15 minute conversation yeah. about how we're both in this really privileged position where we're able to just spend our time learning educating ourselves turning this into content creating things and then giving this and packaging it to, to yeah. give to other people and helping people and helping other yeah. people overcome whatever it is that they're going through which i think is the meaning of life right people it's, helping people like, it's evolution right yeah you're never i don't there's no more fulfilling experience in the world than helping someone do something i think for most people and yeah i get messages every day and i just you know, i get chills thinking about it it's like you're lit up every day it just like we said earlier like you said one sentence it's like yeah. one little sentence will just makes all the work worth it this is so, the power of these conversations it's yeah. the power of the things that you're writing right now you there's many times over in my life that I've heard one quote that didn't make sense to me when I was younger. And then all of a sudden I get to a certain point in life, that right. quote or that reading resonates with me in such a powerful way that it completely changes my perspective on my reality. Yeah. And it is those subtle shifts that completely change the direction 100%. of your life for the better. 100%. Or for the worse, I suppose. Depends yeah. On what, depends on what you're consuming, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Like, like eating. You got to be careful what you're eating what you're reading. You found that one out in Bali, right? <laughs> <laughs> you found that one out the hard way. Yeah, friend. Bali taught me that one. <laughs> yeah, man. Um, I think it's a really good point to end on. I'd love to do this again. I feel like we've got so many different layers that we can go through. Yeah. Um, I think it could be an endless podcast. That it could definitely go on for 12 hours. Um, for the sake of this one, I'd love for people, people to know where they can find you. They need to know where they can get more resources, where they can educate themselves about Bitcoin in general. Yeah, um, I'm pretty active on Twitter. So my last name is Breedlove, B-R-E-E-D-L-O-V-E. My, my Twitter handle is at Breedlove22. Um, on there, I've got links to the YouTube channel, uh, which again is the What Is Money show. It's also in podcast form. Uh, I have links to my Medium page where I post all my writings. Um, I also have a link to a link tree, which like shows you all the links of things I'm currently working on. Um, and 
Yeah, I think that's a great, actually Twitter is a great place to start. Like you can even start following Bitcoiners and you'll see they post really good educational content all the time. And they'll also point to other Bitcoiners that are, I'm not the only one, you know, there's tons of people out there thinking and writing deeply about this subject and, and how it impacts uh, the broader world. And I think, it, you know, Bitcoin Twitter, if you want to call it that, is an amazing resource for people to go out and learn. Not just about Bitcoin, by the way. You're going to learn about everything. Money touches everything. <laughs> yeah. So, ergo, you learn about everything. Yeah, I think what you're doing, I think your gift that you bring to the world is the way that you break things down in such a digestible way. I think Thanks, you man. really break things down into really small components, you build it up in such an effective way that people can really start to understand the bigger picture and these bigger concepts which take a lot of mental yeah. <laughs> a lot of mental capacity a lot of time invested over the years to get to i'm sure yeah 100 percent. i really appreciate it um i yeah i do it for myself you know try to really start at the base level and build it up block by block and then hopefully i'm articulating my thinking well so yeah, i can confirm that you absolutely <laughs> are my friend so yeah um i highly recommend giving this man a follow on twitter if you want to really find out what is going on and really get access to some highly valuable information look this man up thanks joe appreciate thank, it thank you very much for coming on brother thanks man it's a pleasure yeah this is the platinum podcast <laughs>